Welcome to A Fine Time, The Nanny Revisited. This is a podcast about the nanny, where we recap each episode and then discuss, sharing our own unique take on each episode. I'm Bernadette. And I'm Debbie. Today we're talking about episode 25, Everybody Needs a Booby. As usual, we'll start with a very brief summary of the episode. At Sylvia's loony suggestion, Grandma Yetta stays at the Sheffield home while the retirement home is tented for termites. While there, she gives the advice that we could all die tomorrow, so go for it, to who she thinks is Maggie, but is really Gracie. Yet no one figures that out until after Maxwell and Fran have been caught in a tizzy over their concern that 15-year-old Maggie is on a seemingly endless picnic with her new boyfriend, Greg. Yet all's well that ends well, and we learn that Maggie has cooled it with Greg. Instead of understanding that no one buys the cow if they get the milk for free, Maggie learns to not do a thing if you ain't got that ring. Do up, do up. (laughs) Thank you, Bernadette. I I couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, Is there anything you want to add before we jump into the scenes? No, I think we can jump right in. All right. Would you like to take us to scene one, which, full disclosure, is my favorite scene in this episode. So, (laughs) Sure. Go ahead. Um, So we begin in the living room, and Brighton and Gracie are there kind of at the table. And Gracie's telling Brighton about... um, something she just learned and I didn't catch the specific I thought I heard Jupiter she said that she just learned her teacher just told them about a comet that hit Jupiter and exploded like a million atom bombs yeah so Brighton being Brighton takes that opportunity to inform Gracie next year around your birthday a giant comet's gonna come and we're all gonna die of course uh you know that's not great for Gracie because she takes that at face value and she leaves the uh as she's leaving the room um oh the conversation goes like why don't you think why do you think we're living like this dad's spending all his money because you know we we're all gonna die right and he lowers his voice it's like he has a dramatic pause an ominous dramatic thing so so Gracie as she's leaving encounters Maxwell Maxwell of course you know hi to her and she screams exactly <laughs> and, and maxwell is not really perturbed by that it's all on it's all in the Disney, same old day correct uh, and he he asked brighton how how the day is going and brighton's like oh same old same old did you catch what maxwell said um to brighton before asking brighton how things were something about gracie and like her voice your sister's in good voice today mm-hmm <laughs> which is a fascinating response to saying like I think he, you're right he said something like hello Gracie and she just screams bloody murder and runs yes he, he definitely wins father voice. of the year for this continue yeah. um in the meantime at the front door in comes Fran with Sylvia and Grandma Yetta who yep. we have not seen in a while Um, They're getting back from the theater, and they have their various commentary on it. Um, Apparently, Grandma Yetta likes to sing along to things, even if there's not, you know, music. Um, And Grandma Yetta's like, well, the show in my head was better than, (laughs) the musical in my head was better than whatever show was going on. Than the crap we just saw. Yes. But, um. But, you know, of course, when Maxwell asks them how it was, they all say, wonderful. Now, Sylvia's feet are killing her. Fran notes, Ma, those aren't your shoes. And uh, apparently, Sylvia had kicked off her shoes during the performance and had put on, you know, uh, apparently these shoes must be from the lady next to her. Mm -hmm. And Fran's like, you put on shoes like without even looking and sylvie notes she hasn't seen her feet in 20 years right and she it's so condescending the way she says it because she starts with sweetheart and it's just like this the tone of her voice is fantastic anyway continue yes and then grandma yetta meanwhile is asking whose raincoat (laughs) right this apparently seems to be you know um a fine family thing i know grandma yetta is sylvia's mom so Correct. Not technically a fine, but you know, the maternal line <laughs> has this problem. Um, and there's something about a blimpies 
Yeah. Uh, oh, I tell you, it's a miracle we got to Blimpies without them throwing a net over us. Yeah. Because again, during this entire time, there's just kind of like a a bickering, or I don't know, like these little comments among them. Uh, mm-hmm. Yetta asks for a hug from Maxwell. What does she call Maxwell? I didn't have that written grandson. Down. Oh, okay. <laughs> She asks for a hug. He obliges, but then she says harder. So I guess he tightens a little, but then she goes, squeeze me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Fran's like, okay, okay, enough. And notes to, um, you know, tells Maxwell that, you know, Grandma Yetta lost her, like, um, Social Security, I think, at a Chippendales down a yep. G-string, Went I think. Down a G-string. Yep, a Chippendales. Yep. Um, and then I believe, um, right. Well, Maxwell leaves. Yes. But the kids enter. Right. And the kids are back over. Right. And they're back over where they were at the start of the scene. Continue. And, uh, and a grandma Yetta, um, wants, you know, like a hug and stuff from the little Pizzolas. I'm sure you'll. Yep. We'll talk about that soon. Um, and she notes that they got nothing from Fran. <laughs> yes. Can, can I do the, the next? Can I do the next yes. two? Because this is my favorite part of, of the scene. Um, and I think in a previous podcast, I tried to quote it because I don't even remember what the context was. I just remember thinking about this. Ah, yeah. Go for it. Um, oh, they're all their father. They, they got nothing from you. Ma, these are not Fran's children. Fran doesn't have any children. She's not married. She's all alone. Louder, Ma. I don't think they heard you in Uruguay. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm clearly not as good as they are, but to me, this is just such an iconic exchange. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and then from there, what? How does Sylvia change the subject? <laughs> well, she notes that nobody ever eats the fruit in the bowl, and right. Fran's like, Ma, they get their wax, and Yetta says, even the grapes. <laughs> Right. And uh, and she has this look on her face. So obviously she has a grape in her mouth. And Fran yep. just kind of puts her hand in front of her mouth and lets Grandma Yetta spit it out. Yep. Uh, and again, you're going to drive me to the loony bin. You're already there. Uh, exactly. So again, there's just this like familial kind of like bickering going on among these, you know, the women. Yep. And, um, and, you know, notes the Fran says about how different they are and all this stuff but then of course immediately she starts saying you know like oh ma you got some schmutz on your face tries to wipe it and and of course Sylvia's like oh you've got something on her so like they're they're doing identical actions at that point showing how alike they are correct and also note that they're dressed somewhat similarly oh yeah Mm -hmm. and what's funny um and again, for a line later, a little bit later, um, <laughs> it, it, it makes sense too. So I'll bring it up there. Perfect. But also Grandma Yetta in the meantime is like, whose purse is this? <laughs> right. And they assume it's the lady again that Sylvia took the shoes from because they match. Right. Um, and, you know, <laughs> so then the three women are standing next to each other Um if you're looking at the screen, Fran's on the left, Sylvia's in the middle, Yetta's on the right. And um, and I believe, or sorry, is Fran in the middle? Fran I think Fran middle. is in the middle, but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter. But anyway, because it's, uh, do you have the exact exchange? Oh, if it's what, if it's what you're thinking of, if it's what I'm thinking of, I should say, Fran is all the way on the left. You are right. Okay. Or, you are correct. Let me. Okay. Um. If so, you want to go then. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, I think Fran tells the kids something like, you know, it's almost dinner time, you know, go, go get ready for dinner. And they say goodbye. And Sylvia says, nice kids. Meanwhile, they don't say two words. Yet it says, who could get two words in with you? And then Sylvia says, ma, don't wind me up. And she like slaps her. And mm-hmm. Fran says, don't hit Nana. What are you, an animal? And hits Sylvia, I think also. Mm-hmm. And and Yetta says, don't talk to your mother that way. And smacks Fran's hand also. Yes. They, they all do it the, the same thing. Yes, exactly. And it's like one of those little like things on the 
upper arm, like those right. little. So not like a big hit or punch or anything. It's just kind of like, hey, let's quit it. Yes, exactly. Um, but it turns out um, that the retirement home that Grandma Yetta lives in is being treated for termites. And uh, Fran assumes then that, you know, Grandma Yetta is going to stay with Sylvia. And uh, she- <laughs> Sylvia says, sorta. And, you know, suspicious friends, like, what kind of sorta? Is right. it something washable or that you're a size eight? Um, two different, I think, on the spectrum of sortas in their family. Correct. And, you know, uh, Sylvia notes that she's a size eight in the UK. <laughs> right. But basically, um, Sylvia is wanting Yetta to stay at the Sheffield home. I was thinking maybe she could sort of stay with you. Yes. And, um, and, you know, Yetta says, you know, as for it, because she doesn't want to be a burden on family. These people, I don't know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is kind of crazy when you think of everything else that happened in the scene with her. Yes. (laughs) And throughout this episode, but yeah. Correct. But yeah, so essentially, again, what's being set up for this episode is that um, there's this idea of Grandma Yetta staying at the Sheffield home while the retirement home's being treated for termites. Right. And is there I, anything you want to add to that first scene? Um, just a, a, a few things, I think. Um, I think it was only two weeks ago that we saw Fran come into the living room to get an apple from that fruit pile. So it's one of those things that really don't make too much sense. Um, But yeah, I also along those lines, you know, Sylvia changes the subject by starting with more importantly, why doesn't anyone ever eat these, eat the fruit? And it's just like such an interesting segue because how is that more important than (laughs) her picking on her daughter for being unmarried and having no children? Uh Um, you know, I, it's, it's like one of those things where you just look around and the first thing you see is, is like your segue. I, I guess, but it was just like, more importantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and kind of what you were picking up on before with, with how these women are all so similar. This is, again, one of those tropes that we see throughout the series where, you know, statement A will be made and then it's immediately contradicted or it's immediately illustrated by the actions that follow. And it's delightful. Um, The one thing I'll I'll add, the last thing I'll say on that point is um, in the scene, Gracie actually picks up on the dynamic that you've commented on about how they're, you know, fighting so much, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're you're fighting so much it's and, and Francis, yeah, it's hard to believe that we're, you know, related. We're all so different. It's like, Mm -hmm. clearly you're not. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had anything else in, in scene one. Do you have anything else or should I? Can you take us to Maxwell's office? I would love to take us to Maxwell's office. So we go into Maxwell's office and Fran has not appeared there yet. And we instead see, you know, Cece is is sitting and in the chair and Maxwell's flipping through a book and Niles is there. I can't quite recall what Niles is doing. Um, But we start with Cece saying, Maxwell, have I told you how much I love working out of the house? I feel like I belong here and the children are really warming up to me. And of course, again, one of those things where she's saying something and is immediately contradicted, the phone rings. And so she answers, hello? No, there's no Maggie here. You have the wrong number. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? There is a Maggie here, as Maxwell points out. That's his daughter. Ooh. And so um, Maxwell gets on the phone. Ah, Greg, listen, you do know Maggie has her own line, don't you? Oh, that's quite all right. Well, I'm very glad you like her. I'm thrilled she drives you crazy. Keep going, Greg, and you'll never see her again. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. You know, so you get the sense that, you know, Greg is the new boy in in Maggie's life. And Mm -hmm. he's probably sharing too much with his girlfriend's father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Fran comes in and she's like, you know, I'll only take a moment of your time. Um, You know, uh, and boy, you know, this is, she calls it a Lulu. She says, you know, my mother had this crazy, you know, she mentions the retirement home being tented for termites and my, my mother came up with this crazy idea 
that maybe Yetta could stay here. She's a borderline klepto. We wouldn't have a candy dish left in the house. And, um, you know, I'll go tell my mother she's nuts. Well, you know, yeah, basically she understands like that's not going to happen. Although, frankly, Fran manipulates Maxwell beautifully in the scene. Not, not that we're saying manipulation is a good thing, but she gets, she, she gets to the, the end she wants. Anyway, um, she, Fran says, I'll go tell my mother she's nuts. And Max says, well, at least we know where she gets it. And mm-hmm. Fran just gives him this look. And he tries to continue, well, you know, Miss Fine. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. He's, and she's like, what's so funny? Picking fun of the little old lady. And he's like, but you said she was a klepto. Yeah, well, I'm allowed. She's my klepto. And then Maxwell, of course, asks the question, well, you know, can't she stay with your mother? And Fran's response is, the big cats can't share a cage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, if, and Cece agrees with Maxwell, like, you know, you know, stand your ground. We, you know, we don't need some old crone running around the house. And Niles, in perfect Niles fashion, brings over a cup with uh, coffee, tea, something hot, and says, um, um, yes, we are crone heavy. Although with two, we'd have a set, making perfectly clear he's referring to Cece. Mm-hmm. Um, so Maxwell proposes what would seem to be a reasonable middle ground that he'll put Yetta up at the St. Regis Hotel. She'll have room service, everything fit for a queen. And Fran's response is, you can't insult family like that. Me, you can send. I've got thick skin. And, and then she adds, besides, I think it's good for children to spend time with their grandmother, which Maxwell points out, she's not their grandmother. And she says, and Fran responds, oh, all right, you tell her. She lives alone like a dog in that home. Maxwell gives in, fine, let her stay. In fact, I want her to stay. She can have the master bedroom. Ah, no, says Fran. With that marble tub, she'll slip, break her hip, and you'll have a lawsuit on your hands. But anyway, she's happy that, you know, that Yetta's going to have a place to stay. Um, before I ask you if there's anything you want to add to the scene, I just want to note that upon rewatching this, this scene, um, I, I want to comment on the production value of it. Mm-hmm. That, um, as, as we've mentioned, we're in Maxwell's office, but we didn't mention that one of the the two doors is open in the back, like to the patio. And as the scene is going on, you see the the trees in the background moving with the wind. You hear chirping birds. Like the production quality of this the scene was just phenomenal. I I hadn't noticed it before, so hmm. I just wanted to mention yeah. that. I didn't really notice it uh, because you know at the very end, Yetta comes in. <laughs> oh right, go ahead with a boom box um, and she's smoking and she's asking Fran if she could wear her brassiere out there. Like if any, if she wears her brassiere, would anybody see her? And of course, Fran immediately ushers her away. <laughs> Understandably. Yes. Because I believe Fran says something, oh, you won't even know she's here or something or like, I don't know. And of course, immediately contradicted with Yetta coming in with, <laughs> with a boom box. I'm assuming maybe the soundtrack to Schindler's List. I don't know. Whatever song she had uh, said before, I don't know. But Topic, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't, I, I can't, I'm not sure what the song exactly was, but it, it was just pretty funny. So <laughs> immediately contradicts, like, oh, this is not going to be some quiet time. Yeah, no. Would you like to um, take us back to the living room? Yes. So we're back in the living room and Maxwell has apparently gone through Maggie's room and he found the movie Body Heat and he's upset um, because she's a teenager and uh, Fran's not as, you know, doesn't think of it as such a big deal. Um, She's like, oh, it seems you haven't watched The Postman Always Rings twice. Mm -hmm. Um, and Maxwell's worried because Maggie went on a date. She's not home yet. Oh, the, oh, they're home. Um, she got home an hour ago. Got home an hour ago. And then he's like, well, where is she? And then he realizes they must be on the front porch making out. And Fran's like, leave them alone. That was <laughs> a great things. impersonation. <laughs> All things. All four hands are visible. And, you know, they go and they look through. And he, she goes, one, two, three pauses for a second so Maxwell starts to get 
really angry. And then she's like, four, four. <laughs> Here comes four. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Maxwell's like, why are they taking it? It's not like he's going off to the Crimean War. And, um, and so he flings open the door, you know, grabs Maggie, pulls her inside, says, good night, Greg. And did you recognize who Greg was? I did not. It was should, should Barry I? Watson, who was in Seventh Heaven. I don't know if you ever watched Seventh Heaven. Um, I did, but I definitely didn't recognize him. Yeah. So at least it looked to me in the brief moment of the door being open, it looked like Barry Watson to me. Um, I might want to double check that then. Yeah, but I was yeah. going to say, there, there's one way to find out for sure. Yeah. Continue. But anyway, um, and then, you know, Maxwell starts, you know, chastising Maggie about this, the movie. And she, she's like, you went through my stuff. You know, like she's appalled. And he's and she's like, how would you feel if I went through your stuff? And Fran's like, don't bother. He locks everything. And then, of course, does that kind of facial expressions like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Right. And um, basically, it, it turns into one of those, well, you you know, you can't see him. You can't stop me. Well, how about this? You're grounded. Well, I hate you. Stomps mm-hmm. off. Um, but then I don't, you know, Fran kind of hits Maxwell and chastising him. They're having a little back and forth. And Matt, did you notice Maggie comes back in to grab the movie and then run off again? She did, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so basically Fran didn't think Maxwell handled that well at all. Uh, and Grandma Yetta comes in. And uh, she was uh, looking for some cake, I think. Nat- naturally. Naturally. Um, but she has a banana in her hand. <laughs> and as she walks by um, Maxwell and, and Fran, she hits each of them with the banana and says, don't fright- fight in front of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then she... Um, Maggie somehow is there again. I think she came back in with Maggie, maybe. And then she's guiding Maggie upstairs. And, um, you know, Fran's like, oh, you know, they can talk and stuff. And you hear Grandma Yetta go, you want a cigarette? (laughs) To Maggie. Oh, the great. So Uh, random. Her with the banana and just hitting both Maxwell and Fran. Don't fight in front of the kids. I mean, that's good advice. Um, Doesn't necessarily require banana violence but yes. <laughs> and and you were right um greg was played by barry watson okay. according to imdb but it's noted that he, it was uncredited oh, okay so yeah because it, it's very quick <laughs> yeah yeah um did you notice that when maxwell opened the door what he said to the to them what? before he said goodbye greg no Hello, children. Ah, putting them in their place. Bingo. And then, you know, um, I, I, I don't think you mentioned this specifically, but, you know, after Greg's gone, Maggie's been pulled inside. She says, I can't believe you did that. I've never been so embarrassed in my life. And Maxwell says, oh, really? Not even when you were watching Body Heat? And that's when he waves <laughs> the film in her face. The way he said Body Heat was hilarious wasn't it i mean it it was so exaggerated yeah i mean to be fair i've never seen the film um yeah i haven't either what i've read about it which we'll talk about later um doesn't make it sound all that terrible Mm -hmm. but what do i know maybe we maybe we need to have a a movie date where we watch some of the films referenced in the nanny (laughs) and then we can have a more informed opinion (laughs) <laughs> yeah um did you have anything else for that scene i don't think so so i i think i'm going to take us to the the dining room yes uh so it's the next morning presumably and fran comes in and niles is there you know good morning and niles is niles is not in a great mood fran's fine she's in a bathrobe as usual and and she asked him she asked niles what's wrong well it's very disturbing to see mr sheffield and miss margaret fight oh that was a fight I hate you. Who cares? In my house, the fight ain't over till the fat lady grabs the ginzo and says, here, cut my heart out. 
and and Niles chimes in that you know we never say a crossword in our family we just die early of colon disorders Mm -hmm. um maxwell then come maxwell's the next person to to join them in the the, at breakfast and he asked he is grumpy also because of his fight with maggie and he Mm -hmm. asks for tea Mm -hmm. and there's a sort of production if you will with niles opening a ziploc bag and taking a tea bag out and putting it a used tea bag out Mm -hmm. to be clear dropping it in not in maxwell's coffee uh, teacup i guess what on earth is that is what maxwell says and niles explains grandma yetta says this tea bag has seven cups left in it and fran smiles and you know tries to make light of it by saying my bubby yetta doesn't like to waste anything if food is moldy it's a vaccine um which um i'm not a doctor neither is bernadette but that's probably inaccurate um anyway so maggie comes in and you know, Fran gets Maxwell's attention by, I think, tapping him. I think that might be the first time she taps him with her spoon. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Maggie sits down and she says, Daddy, I'm, I'm sorry I said I hated you. Bobietta says you only have one father and she's right. And, you know, he, he apologizes well. And Fran points out, well, you know, you forgot to mention that she's not grounded anymore, right? And he's like, he can't bring himself to say it. And he's like, right, what she said. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Maggie says something like, great, you know, it's such a nice day. Greg invited me to a picnic. Can I go? And Maxwell's clearly going to tell her, I don't think it's a good idea, but Fran smacks him or smacks his hand with the spoon in her hand, he taps him, I guess is a better way to phrase it, taps him. And he says that he changes his tune and he says, as long as you're back by six, you no, know, she taps him again, seven, tap again, eight. And then she clicks the, the spoon against her glass for a positive ding sound and maggie says great thanks guys and you know brighton and and gracie come in and um oh before maggie leaves i should mention that fran says to her have a wonderful time and don't do anything i forgot i did Mm -hmm. which is great advice to to give someone um brighton and gracie come in and brighton says you know yet it turned out to be pretty cool look she gave me a hundred bucks for my bar mitzvah of course she also thinks my name is shmooey um which is kind of a running joke to be fair um and the kids sit down and and, you know they're about they're starting breakfast and gracie says something smells and niles dismissively says just eat it and she says no like something's burning oh no you know maxwell points out it seems to be coming from upstairs so he he and 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 fran rush up to go see what's going on um and I, I can't recall if, if Fran's explanation is in this scene or the next scene, like about the Circle 7 Hotel. It's in the, briefly, yeah, in this scene. Oh, okay. I can't believe she would be smoking in bed since that Circle 7 Hotel went up in, uh, never mind. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Yes. Um, so after the whole moldy vaccine comment, Maxwell talks about how, you know, if if I had spoken this way to my father, he would have throttled me and thrown me into the cellar. And Fran's like, oh man, I, you know, don't like it in this Oliver Twist land. Mm-hmm. Um, and later too, um, there's that exchange where after, um, after Maxwell says she's not grounded anymore, he <laughs> I guess Maggie had also talked with Yetta, which is why, you know, she, I think she notes that grandma Yetta says you only have one dad or whatever Mm -hmm. when she's apologizing and Maxwell says never underestimate or your, um, your. Yes. Ah, how could I forget that? Fran corrects him and says it's Bubby. And then she says, no one's ever underestimated my booby. Thank you. I, you know, I have that. I can't believe I didn't read it anyway. Oh, yeah. I just had to add that, but I uh, thank you. I'm really glad you did because that was delightful. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you like to take us upstairs then? Yes. So, um, again, worried that the burning smell is coming from grandma Yetta's bedroom and she's not responding to the knocks. Maxwell kicks the door open. Yep. And we find Yetta in bed with a gentleman we learn is named Saul. <laughs> yes. And a friend, of course, is like, oh, my God, Yetta. And she's like, that's what Saul said. 
What a coincidence. Saul said the same thing not 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Yep. And um, upon looking around, it, it turns out that I guess Yetta had been making a bagel. <laughs> yeah. So Maxwell says, What's, what the devil's burning? Oh, God. Uh, oh, Saul says Yetta, I ruined your bagel. And Fran says, <laughs> no, you can just scrape off the top. It's so good. And yeah. Maxwell and then, interjects Miss Fine. And then Fran yeah. asks, Go what ahead. did you do with all the cream cheese? Mm-hmm. And then Saul and Yetta have this look on their face. Um, and of course, you know, Maxwell's just infuriated and grabs, you know, like, oh, what, a, you know, you brought this influence into my home. Um, and, and Fran, what does he, Fran say to that? Out. He storms out. Well, first of all, before Fran follows him, she turns to Yetta and it's like, Grandma Yetta, this is the Sheffield home. No one ever has sex in this house. Correct. Um, and Fran follows. Well, Fran goes out to the hallway and Maxwell kind of grabs her wrist. And um, and he's worried now about what kind of. Oh, because sorry, I missed this part. They ask Yetta um, what advice. Before that. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. So just two things. One, before, even before Fran asks Yetta if she's out of her mind and Mm -hmm. no one ever has sex in this house. um, As Maxwell's leaving, she says, well, you know, Mr. Sheffield, it's really kind of sweet when you think about it, which is an interesting tack to take here. so she follows him out and then um, Maxwell says, this is the woman you let give my daughter advice about sex. And Fran again says, advice was at least current. Correct. Um, uh, and Niles ahead. comes by and he, the door's still open to the room and, right. and Niles kind of acknowledges, good morning, Miss Rosenberg. Good morning, Mr. Kniesel. Um, and Max was like, you knew about this? And he's like, well, the room is directly across from mine. Directly, my like, room is directly beneath theirs. Oh, I thought it was across, but okay. Anyway, he goes, bravo, you know, towards Correct. them. And his <laughs> eyes are wide and he keeps walking. And then, um, and then they ask Yetta, like what advice she gave, um, we could all die tomorrow, so go for it. Yep. And of course, Maxwell's like, oh no. And she's he's like, I hold you, I, you know, he holds Fran completely responsible. Um and, and she asks like, why. Yeah, and it's like, that's your grandmother. And he she's like, What? You know, like any woman coming out of Europe with a dining room table strapped on her. It could be anyone. Um it could be anybody's relative. Yeah, and Maxwell seems very puzzled by that. He doesn't understand that. Right. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to add to that scene? So the one thing I'll, I'll mention as Niles, like before Niles is really part of the scene, Maxwell's already turned to start running to go talk to Maggie, to stop Maggie from going to the picnic. And yeah. Niles points out that Maggie's already left, that she left a few minutes ago. Um, and so that that's why he's particularly concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that, that's the only thing I wanted to add to that scene. Okay. Then can you take us to the kitchen? I would love to. All right, so we're in the kitchen. It's later in the evening. As we can see from uh, at the window at the back of the kitchen, we can see it's darker out. Cece comes in. Good night, Niles. It is now, says Niles. And she says, oh, Niles, dear, sweet, pompous Niles. Maxwell and Nanny Fine are on the outs, and there's nothing you can say that will ruin this glorious feeling I have. She's really tempting fate right there. Yes, that's a challenge. (laughs) Niall says, you want to bet? And he signals that she should come closer to him. And he continues, Grandma Yetta, aged 80, living in a home, got a heap of good lovin' last night. And you, and he puts his hand up next to his ears, magnifying what he can hear. Mm-hmm. And Cece 
walks away slowly and says, I hate my life. Mm -hmm. And she walks out the door and and Niles again in this like over the top fashion says, thank you. And takes a bow. Yes. (laughs) Um, Again, another exchange that is just delightful in this, in this, this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, So Fran's coming down from the back stairs and trying to find out if Maxwell's there and he's not there. So she comes in and, you know, Yetta walks in shortly thereafter through the the door to the live the sorry the dining room, and you know Yetta's like Franny, he he left your wallet on top of your dresser, so Yetta signals with her head that she's pointing to Niles, and she's just like, oh, thank you. And Yetta says, you know, Franny, I know it's none of my business, but it might help your marriage if you got rid of that blonde your husband's always hanging around with. I don't know if you've noticed, but your kids are blonde. <laughs> As if Maxwell having an affair with a blonde would produce blonde children within his marriage to Fran. But okay. (laughs) And so Fran, of course, objects. They're not my kids. He's not my husband. She couldn't have spaced out like this with Mr. Sheffield. No, with him, she could recall things from the womb. And, and, you know, Yetta tries to explain a blonde like that with big shoulder pads dragged off your grandfather. And Fran's like, that was a Cossack. You know, like... You know, mm-hmm. clearly Yetta's not entirely all there. Um, and in comes Gracie in her adorable pajamas. And Yetta says, come here, angel puss. So how was your day? And Gracie's so upbeat. Great. I'm not worried about the end of the world. I'm going to live life to the fullest. And Yetta responds, "At a girl. What did I tell you? And Gracie responds, go for it. Mm-hmm. And Fran's like, wait a minute. I thought that's what you told Maggie. Of course, Gracie's left by this point. That's Mm -hmm. not Maggie? No, that's Grace. Oh, I'm confused. Grace is the little one. Shmooey is the boy. And the tall one is Maggie. (laughs) And and she has, anyway, hot pants? Tell her to go for it? What am I, senile? Your husband would throw me out of the house. (laughs) It's just like, you are definitely senile. Um, yeah. And <laughs> <Shmooey. laughs> I, I mean, you got you got to meet people where they are. And she knows yeah. Brighton is schmooey. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do you do you want to add anything to that scene? Oh no, it was so great. <laughs> I, I I really enjoyed that scene. Obviously. Um. So would would you like to take us to the the front porch? Yes. So Maxwell is sitting um, on the front porch um, and Fran comes out and, oh, you've been out here for a while. Oh, I've stoop ball in five minutes, you know, very sarcastically. Right. Um, and she's like, well, you know how we thought, <laughs> you know, grandma, yes, go for it for Maggie. Turns out we were wrong. And um, he gets up, goes inside. Well, hold and- on. Hold on. Yeah, she explains it was to Gracie. Well, she's seven. That's we have much more better. time. Yeah, much yeah. better. Um, gets up, goes inside, and um, I didn't quite catch the line, but she says something about um, you need time to when you're doing something physical because you know, for, right. uh, Maxwell's like, what's taking them so long? And she says, well, you know, you have to eat and stuff. And my mom always said that you have to least wait at least an hour after eating before you do anything physical. And of course, Maxwell kind of bristles and friends quickly like, like Frisbee. Right. Um, and uh, again, Maxwell straight up just tells Fran he's not in the mood. And she says, no man has said that to me before. And then she makes right. a crack about Lisa Marie. Um, assuming Presley, that was my I'm assumption too. I'm wondering, is this the time period when she's married to Michael Jackson? I have no idea because I thought it was sometime in the 90s. Um, but anyway, and um, yes, you know, it would be. I, um, okay. according to Google, they were married uh, from May 26, 1994 to August 20th, 1996. Okay, so uh, and you know, Maxwell's going on and on about how, you know, Maggie's been acting all lately, you know, like all these things have come up. She wanted to start kissing boys and all of this co- coincided with Fran's arrival. 
and she's kind of like pointing out, you know, oh, like she's acting like a teenage girl. And Max was like, well, I'm her father. I want to protect her. And then Fran's like, well, you got to let them grow up. And he's like, well, what if she grows up wrong? Mm-hmm. And Fran says, well, at least you still have Shmooey and the little one. Exactly. <laughs> but essentially, Fran's like, don't be her enemy. Um, and then, oh, she's home. And Fran's kind of calling, you know, she's trying to shoo Maxwell off so that he doesn't appear to be overbearing or anything. She's like, trust is a good thing. Everything's fine. You go upstairs. I'll, you know, greet her. And then, of course, as soon as Maggie comes in, Brian immediately starts yelling, where the hell have you been? Right. Your father has been worried sick and all all this kind of stuff. And Maggie's like, whoa, whoa, you know, like Greg and I have decided to cool it. Um, and, and, you know, Fran's happy to hear that. And she's like, so what did Grandma Yetta talk about with you? And she's like, oh, I zoned out somewhere about buying the cow and to get the milk for free yeah and um Fran's like oh well you know he kind of puts her arm around Maggie ushering her and um you know what they say though don't do a thing if you ain't got the ring do up do up right so anything you want to add to that particular scene um I think I have a couple things um so first you know when they're still on this on the stoop and you know Fran tells Maxwell that we were wrong you know when we thought that Yetta told Maggie to go for it we were wrong he like perks up a little because he's so relieved and then he finds out that it was Gracie and the relief is gone oh yes that's much better she's only seven yeah Um, although like Frank doesn't clarify with him the context no she probably should yeah um because telling a a seven-year-old about sex is definitely worse than telling a seven-year-old like even if the world ends tomorrow, like go for it today. That's mm-hmm. definitely better, especially considering what Brighton had the um, audacity to tell her. Yeah. So um, that that's part point one. Um, point two. Um, so what what's so interesting to me is like as you pointed out, Fran is telling Maxwell to you know go upstairs, go to bed, you know in that in the course of like telling him to you know trust his character building trust is a good thing she says to him go up i'll be up in a minute which is Mm -hmm. such a weird thing for her to say because he's not a child that she's tucking in he's not her husband who she's gonna go you know talk to before bed it's Mm -hmm. just like to me that that line just seems sort of out of place um and what what i'll the two other things i'll mention is that are that uh are that um you know, when when Maggie tells Fran that she and Greg decided to cool it, Fran's immediate response is, why? Oh, good. You know, there's like a, <laughs> like she's responding as Maggie's girlfriend instead of her nanny at first. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Maggie says that, you know, she's just not ready for that, you know? And, you know, do, do you think I would, I'd get into any serious stuff without talking to you first? And Fran's like, oh, I thought you talked to Yetta. And she's like, Yetta, that's where she goes into, I zoned out about <laughs> around buying a cow to get the milk for free. So yeah. yeah, that's all I wanted to add to that scene. Thanks. Do you want to sh- tell us about the credits? Yeah, there's not really much to mention it other than, you know, Fran is on the couch in the Sheffield home with Sylvia and Yetta and they're watching TV. And the comment is, I just love that Mike Myers doing coffee talk. That Verklempt lady is so funny. And Sylvia's, um, no, sorry, Yetta says, no one talks like that. And Sylvia chimes in, and that big hair is very stereotypical. They're like poking fun at a character of themselves, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And and they all touch their hair at the same time. That big hair, yeah. Yeah. So that, that that's all I had for, for, for this scene. Do you want to add anything else? No. No, it was a pretty quick scene. It was very quick. Do you want to talk about anything before we get into our sticks? Um, I don't really have any overarching stuff this time. Do you? I'll, I'll save it for one of the sticks. So. Okay. Okay. Would you like to start with favorite fashion? Sure. Um, I don't think I really had a favorite, but notable 
um, kind of what I alluded to before is that Fran in the first scene, and I think like the second or so, is wearing um, like a leopard print, which yes. is just funny because of the comment she later says about you can't have two cats in the same cage. Right. The, the big the cats, cats can't, can't share. share a cage. Yeah. Right. Um, so it was just kind of funny. Uh, no, that, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, but did you have any favorite fashion? Um, I think actually my favorite is what Cece's wearing in the scene um, in the kitchen. And what I like about it, for, for those who don't recall off the top of their heads, she's wearing black and white. She's wearing basically a black bodysuit with a white shirt that has frills and puffy sleeves or frilly, not frilly, um, flowing sleeves. Billowy. Billowy, thank you. At, they billow at the wrist. And I love that outfit because it, it's very reminiscent of what Fran is wearing in one yeah. of the last scenes in the first episode of the series. Yes, I when I was watching it, I thought that looked very much like something Fran would wear. I think the difference, and I, I have I did not go back to double check, but I think the difference is the pants. Yeah, and, and the colors, of course, because you know Fran would wear tighter fitting pants. CCs are not as form fitting. Yeah, for lack awesome. of better words. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to brush up on my fashion vocabulary so I can properly describe <laughs> the clothing in this in the show um so that is i think my favorite outfit in the show um i will point out that maggie has started wearing brighter colors you know when she is as embarrassed as she's ever been in her life she's wearing like a blue like velvety dress like a uh, tank top uh, strap um spaghetti strap dress over a white t-shirt and then when she comes home from her picnic date she's wearing a black dress over you know pink tights and a pink long sleeve shirt in the in the breakfast scene she's wearing green and white dress like she's starting to show a little bit more personality in her clothing mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah and i thought like did did it have like a faint kind of leopardy or like cat like print maggie's dress yeah the blue one oh maybe. i thought it was i thought it was just the material honestly oh, it could just be that yeah. Like the material, something that we've talked about in other episodes, the material to me looked sort of dated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so do we want to move on then to notable New Yorkers? Sure. Would you like so, to start? Yeah. Um, I've mentioned a couple. Um, Schindler's List comes up again. We've heard that before. Yep. Um, Again, uh, Chippendales. Yep. And um, there, I'm skipping over all the uh, Yerusha Shakap. <laughs> Thank you. In my notes. Let's see. Um, there's also, I don't know, was there any um, significance to the hotel that Maxwell men mentioned, the St. Regis Hotel? Oh, I not really. Probably. I didn't look into it. That one, but, I'm not going to lie. I noted it in my substantive and like my scene by scene summary, but I did not, it did not make it to its notable New okay. Yorkers. I just, I just didn't know, but Body Heat, the movie, um, I couldn't quite catch all the actors, but he mentioned Kathleen Turner as one of them. Yep. Did you William catch Hurt. the other name? William Hurt. William Hurt. Okay. Um, and for the record, um, according to Marriott.com, the St. Regis Hotel is historic, which is not okay. surprising. Um, it was founded by John Jacob Astor over a century ago. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's a five-star hotel, um, which, and I quote, has evolved to reflect the rich heritage of St. Regis while infusing the timeless elegance that has come to define it. Hmm. So I did not know the relation to John Jacob Astor, who unless I'm confusing him with another Aster, he died when the Titanic went down. So oh, I didn't realize that. Interesting. Um, did you look into the summary of Body Heat? Because as mentioned before, neither of us have seen it. Um, so I did, and it was, uh, the Wikipedia entry was quite long and I did not want to 
go too far into it, but um, it was a 1981 erotic thriller that is about an inept lawyer who has an affair with a married woman and the hijinks that ensue from her desire to leave her husband and escape her restrictive prenuptial agreement, um, which is interesting to me because you mentioned the postman always rings twice. Mm-hmm. It's also a 1981 erotic thriller about an affair, which also involved attempted murder. Oh, interesting. The, so I guess there was a theme that year. I, I guess so. Although I will point out that the postman always rings twice is actually the name of two different movies. One is from 1946 and one's from 1981. I assumed it was the 1981 one. Film. Yeah. But, but when I first heard it, I didn't realize there was a 1981 version. So I thought it was the one like the earlier one, oh, which I okay. hadn't seen either, but I'd like, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, well I'm going to want to talk about um, her reference to the postman always brings twice in a later segment. So, okay. I have, okay. I have um, <laughs> Crimean war. Did you know the Crimean war before uh, we watched this episode? I've heard of it. Do you, um, do you have a sense of when it was? No is a valid answer because I will admit that I had no idea. Like I'd so, heard of it. So here's the thing. Like I really heard about it in a book called The Air Affair, which is like a alternate universe version of 1980s London where it's still going and it shouldn't have still been going. Mm-hmm. Um, but so no, <laughs> I don't know when it actually happened. So I looked it up on Wikipedia. Our, our friends at Wikipedia explained that it was a war fought between Russia and an alliance between the Ottoman Empire, France, the United Kingdom, and Sardinia. And it was actually fought from October 1853 to February 1856, which to me makes it a very random um, reference from yeah. Maxwell. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned um, Barry Watson's very brief appearance as Greg. Yep. Um, let's see. Now, pre- yeah, go ahead. You previously mentioned Blimpies, yes. which is a sandwich franchise. Mm-hmm. There's Oliver Twist. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fran also mentions uh, that she never heard her father over the sound of the Bonanza theme song. I just know that was a, a TV show back in the day. It was. Uh, I missed that reference, so I did not prep. Like, I feel like the 70s. 70s, I want to say. Let's see here. It's obviously the... Oh, actually, according to Wikipedia, we were both right. Um, According to Wikipedia, it was, it ran on NBC from 1959 to 1973. Oh, great. I love it when we're both right. I do, too. (laughs) um let's see okay so we already mentioned lisa marie presley and kind of not directly but and this indirectly mentioning you know her marriage with uh michael jackson Mm -hmm. and the don't do a thing if you ain't got the ring is obviously a play on it don't mean a thing if it if it ain't got that swing i did not know that yeah it's a song that's my assumption and then mike myers as in michael myers from and the snl skit correct was there anything else that you had on your list um so as we mentioned you know uh yetta likes to sing in the theater so she referenced so fran mentions that she was singing the song papa can you hear me which is a song from the film yentl which we've spoken about previously. Um, let's see. Uh, you mentioned ultra suede, which was a synthetic fabric, which is used as a substitute for suede leather. Um, Fran makes a not so great comment about Pepperidge Farm, uh, which is a commercial bakery, which is now a subsidiary of the Campbell Soup Company. And I believe it's headquartered in, I think Wikipedia said Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, there's a reference that I believe we've heard before, devil with the blue hair on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Fran makes that comment again about Yetta. And, um, in the scene where Maggie tells Maxwell, she, that quote, I hate you. Um, 
Maxwell says to Fran after Maggie left, you, you could have backed me up. And she says, the pips couldn't have backed you up. I believe that's a reference to Gladys Knight and the pips, which was an American R&B, soul or funk family music group. So I think that's, yeah, I think we, that's all I feel I like we had more this week than we did last week. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, it it depends, obviously very episode dependent mm -hmm. um, where, how many we've got. Um, so I guess we are up to Yudishika. Yep. Okay. So um, obviously the, um, the title of this episode is everybody needs a booby booby is means grandma or grandmother um you mentioned in the first scene um that grandma yetta uh addresses the kids as pizzolas uh it, it's a affectionate term for tiny with teeny so small um schmutz you mentioned we've used that word before it's dirt debris that's what uh fran's trying to get off sylvia's face um, and then, of course, I believe there's also the reference to Brighton getting a hundred bucks for his bar mitzvah, which again is the uh, the celebration of a boy becoming a man, uh, marking his thirteenth birthday. So, mm -hmm. were, were, was there anything else that I missed? No, I just had a general question. Like, oh, I hope I have a general answer. Well, in terms of why Grandma would think Brighton schmooey. Is that like a nickname like that's used or just something they came up with or like I think it's just something they came up with okay. like and not to go too far into our future fun that continues beyond this this episode okay okay where uh she we sh where where she thinks his name is Shmooey. <laughs> okay. so okay yeah sorry can't give you a better answer than that no, that's fine. Would you like to take us into our 90s nostalgia? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, again, a lot of like Maggie's clothes in particular this episode seemed very 90s to me. Mm -hmm. um, like the cuts, the, the fabric, all of that. I'll let you go though first or second. No, no why don't you give you another one? Because I kind of mentioned that in our favorite fashion. So Okay. Um, let's see well whenever um maxwell noted that maggie has her own line i have that too when barry called um we growing up we're not fancy like that <laughs> there us only neither line in my family <laughs> but it would make sense if they're affluent um that they could have their own phone line and for, it kind for... of makes me think of like the babysitters club where they had their own phone <laughs> right i mean for for the record, for our younger listeners, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, people used to have things called landlines, which would be a phone that was like a phone number for your house. And so here, what Bernadette is referring to, I also caught that, um, you know, some people who had, who are affluent would have multiple phone lines in their home. So think of it kind of like the 90s version of a cell phone, except the cell phone doesn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a good summary? Yes. Okay, continue. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, you can take a turn if you'd it, like. It just occurs to me that some people might not have any idea what we're talking about because <laughs> you and I are old. Um, anyway, um, so in the very first scene, you know, you mentioned that Fran has her mother and her grandmother. Um, Fran enters the house first, which makes sense. Presumably she has a key. Um, but she, she shouts at her ma, like her mother, like, you know, ma, what, it's a spring in the dog's neck. What are you so fascinated by? We are to assume that the, the taxi has one of those bobbing head dogs. Oh, <laughs> or at least that's what I assumed. Maybe yeah, I'm alone. No, that, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a spring in the dog's neck. What are you so fascinated for? Anyway, uh, would you like to go again? I really didn't have that much. Okay. So go go forth. The okay. only other thing, I, I mean, obviously we've talked about how Maggie has her own phone line. Uh, Cece answers the phone in the office with the old-fashioned phone. I don't think we had 
old cards in this episode, or maybe we did and I totally missed them, in which case, sorry guys, I'm totally failing at my one job. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the only other thing I want to mention is in the very first scene, you know, Gracie, who's sitting talking to Brighton and Brighton's holding this very old looking Game Boy. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Wait, you're right. Yeah, and then, you know, after Gracie leaves, Brighton is still playing it when Maxwell comes in. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was all I had. Yeah. Okay. Can you take us to some future fun? Okay, I, I got a I got a list for this one. Um, so please ask questions as we go. I may I may choose not to answer. Um, so minor point. Um, the spare bedroom that Yetta is in. I'm not sure we see it again, but in the sixth season we see a spare bedroom that is oriented differently. So interesting. I wonder how many spare bedrooms their mansion has. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've already mentioned that Yetta calling Brighton Shmooey continues. There is an episode um, that we'll be doing in a few weeks called The Wine Cellar, where um, the two, actually, it's probably one, two, three. It's like two months from now, we'll be doing The Wine Cellar. Never mind. It's not that soon. Um, but there, there's a party at which a lot of uh, the fine family is present and Yetta and Brighton team up to try to swindle the family out of some money for Shmooey's bar mitzvah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, just as a side note, I wasn't planning to mention this, but um, in a later episode, Brighton demands he get a bar mitzvah. Um, he wants a bar mitzvah like to do. And so the family goes on a cruise. I won't give any of the back story for why that's relevant, but it's, it's just amusing that he does eventually demand a bar mitzvah like to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here in this, this episode, Niles commented on how his room is directly beneath Yetta's room. And it's amusing to me because in season six, Fran doesn't know which floor Niles' room is on. Which doesn't really make a lot of sense because there's, I think it's in season three um, that Fran actually goes and spends some time, is like in Niall's room for something. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, so there will be more meaningful scenes on the front stoop. We'll see a lot more of it. Um, now I'm, I think I'm getting to the, the stuff you actually want to hear about, like more interesting future fun. Um, so you know, when Fran mentions the, the postman always rings twice, she comments, when he cleared that table, ooh, ha, like, you know, really it's implying it's a turn on. Um, in the episode, Me and Mrs. Joan, Fran gets swept off her feet after a certain desk is swept clean by a certain person. Ooh. I do not want to give any details um, as to who or what desk, um, but that, that's fun. And then um, we both have commented on the line by Fran that this is the Sheffield home. No one ever has sex in the house. Um, sex is eventually had in the Sheffield home by at least three different couples. I can think of three off the top of my head. Um, well, it's already happened. I, I know. Thank yeah. you. Yes. because With Niles. <laughs> and Clara. Exactly. I was going to say, plus, we, as we know, Niles and Clara seem to be getting intimate during her visit. So, like, Fran's comment is not entirely accurate. Um, and then relatedly at the very end of the, uh, the end of the episode, Maggie says to Fran, like, did you really think I'd get into something so serious, something serious about talking to you first? Mm -hmm. Um, we don't see that, uh, serious discussion between Maggie and Fran. Um, and Maggie does get into some more serious activity, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I will, I don't want to give any, any other details away. Um. I hope I didn't say too much or too little. <laughs> okay. It's a fine line, guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> a fine line. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you got it. I got it. I got it. Um, so you know whose turn it is. Is this it time. mine? It's your turn for episode rating to go for first. For once, I am not upset that I have to go first. I am actually giving this episode a five. Okay. Um, I think the banter is just delightful um I really love the first scene it is my favorite scene in this this episode uh, 
again, I, I think I said before that I just find the, the conversation before the fruit um, just being iconic. Um, I, I love the fact that Yetta is getting integrated into the family. I love how she sometimes thinks they're the family. Sometimes she thinks they're strangers. I, I just, I love this episode. I love the confusion about which daughter she told to, you know, go for it. Um, I, I just, I think it's a, a well done episode. The production quality I already commented on, you know, surprised me and is just great. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll also throw it. I love Niles taunting Cece about, you know, Grandma Yetta, age 80, living in a home, got a heap of good loving last night, and you. And Cece's good mood is just completely gone. And anyway, I, I really enjoy this episode. So I'm giving it a five. How about you, Bernadette? I am also giving it a five. Woohoo! Sorry. Um, I'm very I, excited. I, I, to me, I was particularly particularly amused by Grandma Yetta's constant not understanding that Maxwell is not Fran's husband and those are not Fran's children. Mm -hmm. And then, of, of course, like I, I already mentioned, the whole um, thing is like, Gracie's the little one. <laughs> Shmooey's the boy. <laughs> the tall is Maggie. Right. So. Um, I, I, I will just mention that Yetta's confusion also continues. Mm -hmm. Um also, I should probably mention, I'm sorry, this should have been in future fun. We will see more of Grandma Yetta. We're actually going to see her, I think, in two weeks and then in a number of other episodes this season. She, she, I don't think she, she's not on every episode, but she becomes a more frequent, a more mm -hmm. frequent flyer, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it's always delightful to see her, her confusion as to who people are continues and, mm -hmm. I don't want to say want to get rid of the blonde. I don't right. like it, but the children are blonde. Your children are blonde. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't my children. He's not my husband. <laughs> Poor Fran has, is put in the position of after being ridiculed by her mother for these not being her children. Him not She's being all her. alone. Exactly. She's not married. She's all alone. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, Yetta is just a, a pure delight, and we will see so much more of her, and her constant confusion as to who the Sheffields are will also continue. Um, so yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's delightful. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have anything else? Or? No, I do not. All right. Well, that's all we have for you today. We hope you had a fine time with us as we revisited the nanny. Join us next week when we'll be discussing episode 26, Material Fran. If you would like to reach us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Nanny Revisited. You can also send us email at a fine time nanny revisited at gmail.com. Have a great week.